Okay. Got it. Cool. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Modern Psychedelics Podcast. I am so beyond stoked to be sharing this conversation with you today, not only because as it says in the title that it's going to be about microdosing, but also because the two guests that I have for you today are very special and it's just going to be such an, such a beautiful conversation uh, beyond the basics of microdosing. So let's get right into it. I have Adam Bramledge here and Jim Fadiman. So why don't we start with a little introduction? Uh, Adam, why don't you take it away? Yeah. Hey, I'm Adam. I'm founder and CEO of Flow State Micro. We're a functional mushroom company, as well as a microdosing education platform. I work one-on-one -on -one with clients to optimize their microdosing experience, as well as working to educate people on the uh, ancient history past of microdosing, as well as best practices. I was honored to meet Jim about four years ago and have been, you know, working, um, on my own and sharing all my data with him and I'm really excited to uh, have him on with us as well. So that's a brief basics on me. Uh, I'm Jim Fadiman and I've um, been working with high dose psychedelics for the past uh, for 50 years and then I uh, fell into microdosing and so I've been doing microdosing nothing else for the past 10 or 12 years getting information from all over the planet and have been continually amazed. I've been working with Adam since we met uh, and have learned probably more from him about what really happens in depth when people microdose uh, than I've had from any other source. And, and we love working together. Wow. That's quite, that's quite a statement that you've learned more through learning what his clients are going through than anywhere else. Yep. Wow. So, well, let's get into that. That's what we would call the citizen science, right? Yep. Which microdosing has been built on. So why don't we start there? Because that's kind of where this modern microdosing movement in North America started. So tell me a little bit about that, Jim, and how the citizen science first started for you and the process of kind of learning about microdosing back in the day. Well, I was only interested in high doses and a friend of mine, Robert Fort, told me that Albert Hoffman used very low doses when he wanted to take a walk in the woods and think, and that it was good perhaps for relationships and other things. And I thought, I don't care about any of that. I just want people to transcend and see God and be eaten alive by anacondas and all that cool stuff at the high end. However, the universe said, why don't you just take a little time and look into it? And a number of friends uh, just tried it at my suggestion, psychonauts, they're called, will try anything. And people reported that it was beneficial and it had no psychedelic effects. It simply seemed to realign parts of people that were out of whack. Um, and it's, that's been the last 10 years very much summarized. And the word out of whack covers an enormous range of possibilities that none of us associate with, with psychedelics. Hmm. What do we know or what do we think based on the citizen science or even any of the research that's done on microdosing about what is it about microdosing that brings people, how did you say? Into better alignment. Into better alignment out of, out of whack. Yeah. Thoughts? Like they get into whack, I guess. <laughs> they get into whack. <laughs> Clearly the metaphor dies very badly. So what we're finding is when people use microdoses, their healing, their normal healing system seems to be um, improved so that if it's pain, they report less pain. If it's depression, they report less depression. Um, if it's a number of, of autoimmune diseases, they report improvements. If it's some things that we don't quite know what causes them, like migraine headaches, they report less. So overall, it looks like the system writes itself and parts that are in disequilibrium seem to come back into, into their own capacity for self-healing. And that's been the reports from thousands of people, literally, from um, well, my research was 51 countries. The latest research from microdose.me is 81 countries. So it's a international phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Do we know what that mechanism is? Like, do we actually know what's going on well, when people are microdosing mechanism, You know, the word mechanism is something the FDA says, you have to have some theory before we're going to give you a license. Um, mm -hmm. We don't know how most anything works. 
but we do know when it does work and when it doesn't work. I mean, if, if you take your hand and make a fist, you don't know how you do that. You set, your brain says, make fist, and the other end of you says, okay, I make fist. And you say, well, what's the mechanism? Well, the mechanism is as the brain told me to. Well, that doesn't count as a real mechanism. And your brain and your fist say, well, I'm sorry, that's all we've got. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, there is some science, and it isn't very clear, because microdosing affects too many conditions for the normal term mechanism to make sense. Mm -hmm. It's a okay. little bit like taking a vitamin. No one says, what's the mechanism for vitamin D? Mm -hmm. They just say vitamin D seems to help the whole body. Oh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to put a pin in the, in the, what is the research saying to us? Cause I want to hear from Adam about the citizen science scene, let's say in psychedelics and microdosing. I saw in your bio, you have citizen scientist. <laughs> I know that you work with a lot of clients and you work with a lot of uh, microdosing people come to you to get support with microdosing. So what are your thoughts around the citizen science scene in not just microdosing, but in the psychedelic realm in general, the importance of it and the role that it plays? I think it's extremely important. I think there's tens of thousands of people who can't wait three to five to 10 to 15 years for the FDA or the DEA or everybody to pass this and test everything and make it reasonable and legal. The honest truth is the more research I do, we have an ancestral connection to microdosing. We were originally citizen scientists from watching animals who were the first citizen scientists. So, you know, that's how we learned initially. And I think that that's what we need to get back to in 2022 is being more of a citizen scientist and, and learning how to take care of ourselves with these small amounts of mushrooms or LSD, whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's how I'd answer that. Mm -hmm. and the, the term citizen scientist is when someone writes a report and says, I have had chronic fatigue syndrome and I've been microdosing for three months and my symptoms are much, much less and I function better and I'm much happier. That's a report from a citizen scientist. That's an important report because that information is very hard to obtain in a regular research setting because in a regular research setting, you pre-set you pre who's going to be in there. And you wouldn't take, for instance, chronic fatigue syndrome. That's never been suggested as anything related to psychedelics. But there is some information. Now we know at least one case. And for many, many sciences, one case is a lot. Astronomy, botany, geology, um, all are very excited when there's one case. Because if there's one case, something exists. Mm -hmm. And part of my relationship with Jim over the last few years has been sharing the new the new cases you know there are people that will come to me and for the first time they're getting relief from symptoms that every medication every modality from yoga to acupuncture couldn't help and you know then we're relaying that to other people and other citizen scientists maybe somebody with cluster headaches tries a microdose of lsd and for the first time in their life they get relief so, you know, the original science is citizen science. You know, I was interviewing Jim for one of my upcoming classes and he talked about Galileo and how important the early citizen scientists were. And that, you know, it's important that we don't forget about what's happening within our community. We can't leave it up just to labs and scientists and people with, you know, certain degrees that tell us what works and what doesn't. We still have to have some power to take that into our own hands and share that information within our community. Yes, yeah, so beautifully said and a really great segue into the question that's coming up for me right now, listening to you both, you know, what do you believe is the responsibility of the citizen scientist, not only to themselves, right, whether they're like a self healer or someone who's really invested in um, researching different things that work for, for them personally, um, but also to society right? What is the responsibility and the contribution of the citizen scientist? Well, if you think about it historically, certain citizen scientists in every culture end up as herbalists, shamans, healers, 
because they simply have taken more time and more energy to discover what's around them and what works for the people who come to them for help. That's always been the model. We have added a layer of bureaucracy and capitalism to it um, that has been very successful for the capitalists, um, but it hasn't eliminated the actual underground or on the ground um, finding out what helps people and doing it. So the responsibility of any citizen scientist is to share what worked and also to share what didn't work. You know, don't eat one of those, you're gonna throw up. Eat two of those and you're gonna feel a lot better. That's citizen science. Also it's kindness, it's normal, it's human behavior. What do you think, Adam? <laughs> I think back to this, you know, the stoned ape, I think to the Aborigines in Australia and their use of paturi in small doses to aid in hunting and, and stimulating effects and stamina. And I think of the Rara Murray in Mexico and, and the Weechal who use small amounts of peyote when they go out for their annual peyote hunt. So honestly, I think that this has always been a part of our evolution and our history. And I feel like it's time that, you know, we are as people, we as a people are allowed to use these substances again without fear of arrest and prosecution and all those things. So um, this is our past. So it's not surprising that thousands, tens of thousands of people are reporting that microdosing is helping them in current times as well. Yeah. Amen to that. Um, how, how do you see it impacting or informing the research that's being done? in modern times? Does it impact it at all? Sure. Well, one of the things it does, it says to researchers, wow, there's something over here you ought to look at. Mm -hmm. And uh, a year or two ago, it was really easy to answer the research question, which is there wasn't any of formal peer reviewed, etc. Now there's a wonderful article um, which reviews the best 44 microdose research studies and compares and contrasts and evaluates and so forth. So we now are beginning, what we have is researchers are figuring out, um, like all of us, you know, you go where the money is and you go where the excitement is and you go where the kind of pre-results have already been given you. Okay, so if you have something, say, like depression, and we have a few hundred cases of people who've microdosed successfully for depression. And someone says, I wonder if microdoses are good for depression. And you'd say, and I'm a researcher. Well, it's not going to be hard to figure out what you might want to do. It's not guesswork. And we're actually seeing that connection. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 No, there's research now beginning to happen in a lot of places, a wonderful uh, study in, Aust in uh, New Zealand um, through a hospital system, except the differences they're saying to people who enter the study, here's your microdosing for the month, keep in touch. Mm -hmm. That's very different from people being basically um, caught in a therapy room for eight to 10 hours with two therapists for high dose work, where you wouldn't let anyone out of the room or out in the street for their own safety. It's a very different model. It's much more conventional. If you go to a psychiatrist and you say, I have such and such, and he says, well, I think this medication may help you. And you get a month's worth of it. And then he says, go home and let me know how it goes. That's research. Mm -hmm. That's And that's the kind of research we're beginning to get because people are beginning to understand that treating a microdose the same way you treat a macrodose um, doesn't work. It's just silly research. Mm -hmm. And what's fascinating is every day I hear about new research on microdosing. And there was a new study that just was reported by Dr. Connor Murray, PhD, where they found that uh, LSD 13 or a 13 microgram dose of LSD did not cause subjectical effects in the participants. They didn't notice any difference between a placebo, yet on the brain scans, there was brain activity at the 13 micrograms and they scored higher on the reward task tests. So it's fascinating that subjectively, they couldn't tell a difference with placebo, but they were able to see more brain activity on the 13 micrograms of LSD as well as they scored higher on certain tests. So interesting new stuff coming out every day in the world of microdosing and research. And uh, yeah, Connor Murray with some great stuff. Interesting. <laughs> well, we'll we'll link that in the show notes, that study. How, 
Yeah. I'm curious. What were the, what were they actually measuring in that study? Um, because with microdosing, or what was the subjective effects that they were measuring? Because with microdosing, you're not really supposed to feel a difference. So how are they, how are they measuring it? Do you, do you remember from reading that? Well, remember when you're measuring brain waves, people don't have to know, notice. Not the brain waves, but the subjective, the yeah, they had subjective a, they, reported. They have results. a subjective, they have a subjective um, testing scale that they ask the person. I think it's between one and a hundred, you know, how you feel, do you feel high, certain things. Uh, actually, Dr. Connor Murray came and recorded a 30 minute talk on this actual study in detail in the microdosing masterclass that I'm doing with Jim. So I can't give you the full details, but I do know that there's a certain kind of test that they give the person asking them if they notice anything, and then they're able to determine um, the differences that way. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay. So Adam, you talked a little bit about the doing research into the ancestral and the kind of ancient lineage. Can you tell us a little bit about what you found? Yeah, so obviously everybody likes to start with the stone age hypothesis. I won't spend too much time on it because we can't prove it. So what can we prove right now? We can prove a direct link to the aboriginals of Australia, microdosing puturi, which is uh, acacia DMT, a, a shrub or a bush. And again, they're supposed to be the first people from Africa, 75,000 years unchanged. And you know, in the last three or 400 years, British explorers, you know, witnessed them using the Paturi in, in these ways. So again, I've been able to track it from uh, the aboriginals of Australia over to Mexico, a bunch of different people using it throughout Mexico. Um, and then, you know, throughout the world, uh, whether you're going to Siberia, you know, obviously they're using Amnita muscari in large doses. It would be safe to say, I would bet they probably tried small doses and medium doses as well. So there's just a real history, really as far back as you can go. And it really starts before humans and homo sapiens, and it starts with animals. You know, what I discovered is that the jaguar introduced the Tucano Indians to ayahuasca. And it was under the idea that they would have jaguar eyes and that they would be better hunters. They could see at night, their eyes would dilate. So the farther I look, the deeper I go, you know, most of these indigenous um, communities all have some kind of plant, fungus, root, or shrub that they were microdosing to stimulate energy, suppress appetite, and uh, help them hunt for, for longer times and longer distances. So you're, you've obviously dove really deeply into the lineage of microdosing and using these various psychedelics in small varieties. I mean, what do you make of all of that? Like, what do you make of the the history and the anthropological lineage of it and place it into modern society and kind of like the conversation that we're having about microdosing today? Well, let's take it back just a step and re rethink it the other way. What do you think has happened that the first time in human history for 50 to 75 years, we have not been using microdoses and higher doses of psychedelics for the first time mm. and has human culture improved in the last 7500 years and there's a lot of evidence that the answer is no so if we contextualize it that way uh, it it fits more into the historical portrait okay well how would you answer your own question <laughs> what was my question <laughs> <laughs> Your question was, right, flipping it, um, it was. Well, let's oh put God. it this way. There was a lot more optimism in the 60s with psychedelics than there is currently. Right. Well, and, what do you think and happened? What, I, uh, what happened is I mean, the you people were there. who were not using <laughs> psychedelics got very mad at the rest of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, oh, yeah, and it should be mentioned that psychedelics were made illegal by President Nixon for a political, not a medical, not a psychodynamic, not a psychiatric, not a physiological reason. It was a mm -hmm. method of being able to attack the groups he hated, who also happened to be groups often against the war. That's historically clear. Yeah, so we know that now. We had the lull in psychedelic use worldwide was a political uh, expedient of a of a, of a not very popular president. Mm -hmm. 
But let's take it back even farther. Nixon in our time, but you go to Cortez and the conquistadors and, you know, they tried to wipe out the whole use among Aztec society. Or you look at, you know, maybe the use of ergot um, by quote unquote people who are called witches, all of that stuff. You know, people have long been bastardized or demonized for the use of plants and fungi and, and psychedelics. Mm-hmm. But like Jim said, this drug war has only really been going on in our lifetime for 50 years. And it's time that we congratulate drugs for winning the war on drugs um, because they won. And, uh, you know, intoxication is a part of our life. It's a part of animals' lives. And to take that away from people is to take away part of being human. Yeah, totally. And the space has gotten, I mean, for my observation of it, the space has gotten pretty damn serious <laughs> over the last few years. And it's like, yeah, yeah. you know, it's all about the healing and it's all about the therapy and all of that, which certainly has its place and is so beneficial. Um, Remember the way the system works, uh, there's no category of medicine for wellness. You can't put out something that has FDA approval unless it cures something bad. Mm -hmm. Psychedelics have this problem is that well people like them as much as people who have a physiological or mental need for them. So they don't fit the category system. And, and, and we're redoing the categories because we're sensible, realistic beings who mm -hmm. also can hardly imagine the, the, re, the necessity for making illegal things that apparently are predominantly for healing. Mm -hmm. It's against common sense. Yeah. Yeah. There's the whole, I mean, yeah, there's two categories, right? The, the well, the people who fall in the wellness category are the, I guess, uh, what do they call them in research? The, the happy normals. <laughs> what do they call them? <laughs> no, see, we don't even have good names. Healthy for normals. It's healthy normals. Body. I like happy the healthy, normals. happy normals. The healthy, right. happy normals. Right, pursuing wellness. So going not from a state of dysfunction, but a state of from a state of function to optimization. Right. These are mm -hmm. our coaching clients. These are people who usually come to coaching. And then we have the people who need the therapy who are facing some sort of dysfunction in their lives and psychedelics can serve both of these people. But what I'm noticing is really the, the conversation is hyper-focused on the people who need them for healing. And I'm curious to hear both of your thoughts on psychedelics, microdosing, all of it for recreational use for people who do fall in that wellness category. Let's start with you, Jim. <laughs> well, you just described it. Um, I mean, I'm remembering when I first realized that that what Adam has now just got in depth, my first awareness that I hadn't discovered microdosing, I just uncovered it as usual, is an anthropologist friend after pointing out to me that it's highly likely that everybody before me had tried little low doses. He said, and by the way, I haven't had a cold in 15 years. And I said, why not? He said, well, a little bit of mushroom when you start to get a cold really helps. It's not been explored but now your audience knows, okay? Yes. That's how citizen science works, which is it is normal to have things in the culture that benefit you. I mean, imagine if going to the gym were illegal, mm -hmm. okay? And people would say, well, why? Well, people get very injured at the gym. People see really people who are healthier and bigger and thinner and they get depressed. So depression is caused by the gym. People can't afford it. It's unjust. There's social inequity. We should not allow the gym. Now, at some point, you're going to interrupt me and say, could you stop the nonsense and can we get back to the topic? Okay, that is the topic. Uh, since LSD was made illegal in the United States, which we know is a method for creating a black market, over, this is U.S. government figures, not mine, over 35 million Americans, is just Americans and just LSD, 35 million Americans have taken LSD since it was illegal. And the data from government studies, this is now hundreds of thousands of people against the control of hundreds of thousands of people, they are healthier than people who have not had psychedelics. So that's what we're looking at is what's normal, sane behavior and how can we return to it? Okay. 
Adam, what do you think? <laughs> Psychedelics for recreation? You Psychedelics know? Psychedelics for healthy, for normal? I think uh, healthy normals and everybody um, has a right to safe use of psychedelics in the right set and setting with the right and proper support. With that said, as we legalize this, we also have to decriminalize it so that we aren't putting people in jail who might not be able to afford a super expensive MDMA or mushroom journey in Topanga Canyon right? So we need to do it differently than we did cannabis. We need to stop arresting people for it. We need to allow them to grow mushrooms under their bed if they can't afford to buy microdose capsules or whatever they're looking for. And we need to decriminalize it, right? Because it is something that is part of our life, right? We came from plants and animals. We came from mushrooms, right? Mushrooms were here before all of us. So it's not surprising that these mushrooms are super helpful and super healing for people these days. And they've taken it away from us, right? With this drug war. So now I think it's time with education. We know it was a, a war on people. It was a war on ethnic minorities. And we know that the research in the 50s was productive. And it's great that we're starting up research now, but there's a lot of people who can't wait five to 10 years. And I think we could start with decriminalizing it and uh, continuing to educate and go from there. Mm -hmm. And have you, have either of you noticed, and I want to hear from both of you, um, if microdosing psychedelics is more or less effective for either of those groups, the wellness and the therapy groups? <laughs> well, um, let's look at the Microdosing Institute in Holland. Uh, a version of microdose of, of mushrooms is legal called truffles. They have about 5,000 people they have helped. And since it's been legal, it's not been a big issue. As they say, it's a lot easier to do research when it's legal and everybody wants to volunteer. Um, so they have 5,000 cases of people who are satisfied with whatever they used mushrooms for. That was clearly not a therapy oriented orientation. It was a desire and intention orientation. And they include a coaching uh, element, which is people will get more out of something if they pay attention, if they have an intention, if they take notes. Obviously, if they take it, um, you will get more benefit out of it if you take it seriously. That's one of the things we have learned. It doesn't do the work. As someone said in a, in a blog recently, it's not a medicine. Yeah, I like to call it a tool. You know, it's not a magic pill. It's more of a tool. And, you know, a, a knife can be used to murder somebody or it can be used very carefully in surgery. So again, it's how you use the tool. But microdosing isn't a magic pill. There's so much interpersonal work and so many things that has to happen within the person. I just want to make sure everyone's clear that this isn't like a pharmaceutical where you get a magic pill, there's a lot of work that goes into it, which is why education and even coaching is really important because a lot of times, you know, I think they did a new global study, 32,000 people, 20 to 40% quit microdosing within three days because they were taking too high of a dose. And, you know, we can reduce a lot of harm and, and whatnot just by educating people on what is a microdose. Yeah, goes for micro and macro dosing, right? Um, what is, what does take it seriously mean? What do you recommend people do to take a microdosing protocol seriously, Jim? Well, not surprisingly, they should know how much to take. And the rule of thumb is start low and go slow and take time off. Uh, microdosing, unlike pharmaceuticals, does not work well taken every day. Now, that's a very big shift for almost everything in and, and where we call it your medicine cabinet. We don't call it your health cabinet, which might be a more interesting place to put stuff. Um, so kind of normal, which is what's what's the correct amount to take? How should I take it? How often should I take it? And what can I do to improve my experience or to get more benefit? Those are very realistic questions. And that's what Adam and other coaches and uh, institutes around the world are beginning to offer. Okay. And you obviously have created the Fatiman protocol, taking a microdose once every three days for at least one month. Um, I often hear various 
answers for how much to take, right? We say one twentieth to one tenth of a normal dose. What is that actually? Well, okay. (laughs) Where should people start? Actually, actually, if we're looking at numbers, what seems to be correct, and the only caveat is people do very well with much less, okay? LSD, micrograms, millionths of a gram, the range for most people is about seven to 12. For mushrooms, and again, mushrooms vary enormously in how much psilocybin is in them, but approximately a tenth of a gram to four tenths of a gram. Most people for most situations. And other substances, that's why that one tenth to one twentieth is in there, because there's an awful lot of bizarre substances out there that people are using, many successfully. But I've just covered like 95 to 96 percent of what people are using. Now, also, mushrooms can be taken with additional substances called stacking. And I'll turn that back to one of the stacking experts who happens to be on your program. Adam? Stack, stacking student, stacking student. Thank you. Um, yeah, we have a stack. You know, Paul Stamets was the first in the microdosing space to introduce stacks, but stacks is something that's been going on since, you know, stacking mushroom psilocybin with honey for thousands of years and cacao in the Aztec society. So stacks are just adding other herbs or mushrooms that may cause an entourage effect or, you know, potentiate, optimize the actual um experience you're having, you know, Paul Stamets introduced lion's mane and niacin, uh, believing it makes it more available throughout the body out to the tips of the toes and the tips of his fingers, he likes to say. Um, I really like the chaga mushroom, the cordyceps mushroom, the lion's mane and mataki stacked with the psilocybin. So that's what I've really enjoyed, you know, and just going back to dosages, it's important to know that one size doesn't fit all, you know, if 100 milligrams is my dose, it doesn't mean that it's going to be yours. And what I've seen over the last four years is I've seen for mushrooms, the dosage is being lowered and lowered and lowered. So for somebody that's a beginner, I'd start at 50 milligrams, right? I've seen grown men have reaction to 25 milligrams. So if you're new to this, and a lot of people are, you should start low and go slow because you can always take more, but you can always take more, but you can never take less of a psychedelic, right? So start low, 50 milligrams. You know, maybe you go up to 75, maybe eventually 100. But once you hit that point where, you know, you've noticed you've taken something, then you need to turn it back down a little bit. So I'd like everyone to know that, you know, everyone has their own sweet spot. That's what we call it. We Mm -hmm. call it your sweet spot. And it's going to change between variety of mushrooms, right? A golden teacher at 100 milligrams is going to hit you differently than a penis envy at 100 milligrams. So there's a lot of information that people really need to know. Um, to be safe and successful. Now, the reason that people take too much is because they're imagining that a microdose is a little bitty tiny high dose. And it's not. So they take enough and so they feel like, oh, it's coming on a little bit. That's too much. That's not the right dose area and won't work as well. How, how do you know you've hit that sweet spot? We know that if you start to feel, you know, maybe sensations in the body, maybe sensations in the brain that you, you've taken too much and you should tone it down. How do you know you've hit that sweet spot? Is there stuff that something that people can look for, like um, mood markers or, or something else? <laughs> well, I think, of, I, I think of Violet Waldman's book title, A Really Good Day. I mean, essentially Mm. your day just cruises by and you get to the end of the day and you're like, wow, that was a, that's a really good day. Why was that such a, oh, it was a, it was a microdose day. Oh yeah. Those meetings went really well. Oh yeah. I flew through those emails. Oh yeah. But it's not like you're flying through the emails and then like a pig flies through the room and you're like, you know, there's no classic psychedelic (laughs) effects. You should actually forget that you've taken something throughout the day right? Now, it might not be sub perceptual per se, right? You might feel little boosts of energy, a little bit of brain activity, but it should never get to the point where, like Jim said, you feel like you're coming on. Or as I like to say, anxiety is your indicator. If anxiety has risen and you're anxious or you don't want to be in a social setting or you feel like you're getting high, that's way too high. Mm -hmm. If your anxiety is lessened and you have a really good day, you've probably found your sweet spot. 
Mm, I love that. So basically you'll just know. <laughs> well, you'll just know. I think citizen science. Yeah, Empowering yeah, so the citizen sciences. Yeah. What were you going to no, say, Jim? Uh, yeah. If you've ever tried a cup of coffee, ever had too much, oh. ever had not quite enough, that's how. Our bodies are really very well designed to give us information about what works for your body. Yeah. Isn't it funny how we just like the mind and the Western mind and it just like wants all the answers and the specific answers, but microdosing is such a personal journey that is so empowering to like really tune into what works for you. And it can be so different for everyone. Um, yeah, there's a, I just listened to someone say, and I haven't got it quite right, but it's the numbers and the data prevent us from being in touch with the experience of the people. So when we say there's a range, um, uh, a very interesting, if you wanna hang out with a few hundred thousand people interested in microdosing, Reddit has a subedit called microdosing, has 200,000 people on it. And when someone has a question, there's an amazing range of fascinating answers. And one recently that, that woke me up, someone said, well, um, you know, Fadiman says 0.1 gram or hundred milligrams. Um, that's too much for me. I've been taking half of that and it's working really well. Anybody else? And then these answers just poured in from all over the world, basically saying, yeah, me too, me too. Yeah, no, I take even less than that. No, I take less than you're taking and it's working. So. That's how citizen science leaps ahead of what laboratory science can do. Because mm -hmm. that's very, very hard to do a study between tiny amounts of tiny amounts. But it's mm -hmm. very interesting to find when you give it to people, they will tell you their personal differences, not yours and not in general and not averages and not medians, et cetera. It's a very different way of doing science. Um, and it's not only much more satisfying, but you, you, you just learn things you didn't intend. And I enjoy when citizen scientists learn things that they weren't planning on learning. Like one client I had microdosed for depression and found out that it cured his eczema, right? And his partner was dealing with menopause and microdosing helped her with menopause, yet it healed his eczema. He wasn't even trying to heal his eczema. So is placebo a potential there? I, I don't know, but it's just interesting because without citizen science, without the internet, without Reddit, and without that man right there, Jim Fadiman, collecting all this data and keeping this topic alive and talking about it, I'm not sure how much we would all know about this. And you know, for me, four or five years ago, it was watching videos of Jim on YouTube explaining to me microdosing that ultimately saved my life. That showed me mm -hmm. that, you know, microdosing psilocybin throughout the course of, of the week on a Fatiman protocol could greatly improve my mental health and my addiction to misery. So, you know, I'm also a patient here. You know, there was a company called Hair Club for Men when I was a kid and the guy like pull his toupee off at the end and he'd go, and I'm, and I'm a client too. He was like the CEO. Well, I'm a client too. You know, I use microdosing to treat my own depression. And if it wasn't for Jim Fadiman talking about this at seminars and his book, Psychedelic Explorer's Guide and videos on YouTube, this modern movement wouldn't be as far along as it is. Mm -hmm. So part of my job in this life is, is to, you know, help get this out there and, and help people realize how important Jim Fadiman is. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> You're doing a great job, both of you. And I, and on behalf of Many psychonauts and members of my community are so, so grateful for the work that both of you do and the work that you continue to do in um, spreading this to people. Um, I, I heard you say in another podcast, Adam, that you find that you tend to microdose less and less as time goes on. And I found the same thing with me. Like I had like the first time I discovered microdosing, I did it for six months and I was in therapy at that time. And I was also working with ayahuasca. So it was a great integration tool. And it was like the missing piece of my toolkit. Like it was just kind of the last little thing that I needed to really take everything to the next level. But then after uh, I, I felt, I sensed that it was time to stop and I don't really feel like I need to microdose anymore. I kind of got what I needed out of it. What do you think of that? Like, do you find that people do it for the long term or kind of? 
<laughs> yeah. How, how do people do it? <laughs> this, is, this is, you know, you're just recapitulating my last 10 years. See, I can, I'm trying to control myself saying, would you mind just sending me a very brief report? Because what, what you're Anything saying for is, you, <laughs> what, what, what you're saying is here's how I know I'd had it done enough and how I stopped taking it. See, we don't have too many of those. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's really helpful. I happen to be writing a book called All About Microdosing, and you are invited. Okay, that's how citizen science works, and that's how you, as a, as a member of citizens, automatically just became a member of science. Oh, so, I accept the invitation. <laughs> oh, goody. <laughs> this is how it works, which is uh, the community helps itself. And one of the things... Mm -hmm. One of the things we learned in the 60s is people really enjoy helping each other. It's like one of mm. life's great pleasures. And when you have something that's safe, microdosing, and effective in many cases, you share it. Yeah. You know, just like you say, with, have you heard Taylor Swift's new album? Oh, my God. Right. That's that's just to make someone else's life a little better. And that's what we're doing. Is it? And, no, I'm know, somebody <laughs> said, if you you know, if you're doing what you love, you never work a day again. It's not yes. true. You work very hard, but you do get to work at things. I mean, what you're telling me just makes me so happy because that's what it's about. It's yeah. you. Well, and, and you know, that's yeah. a lot of what we see exactly is that people will do it for a few months, six or seven months, and then they'll just wake up the next day and they'll be like, you know what? I'm okay. I'm good. Yeah. And maybe it's a tool in the toolbox that they pull out six months from now if they're struggling or they're going through something. But the longer people microdose in my line of work, the people I'm working with, the less they need it, right? And that's a really beautiful model because that's mm -hmm. not the seven day a week, rest of your life, Western pharmaceutical model. Um, you know, there's an afterglow and, and people benefit from these days and sometimes weeks and months after even, even on these small doses after a period of time. So... Yeah. What we know is the brain improves its functionality when you microdose. And at some point, the reason that you're taking days off is to allow your system to adapt to its improved state on its own. And mm -hmm. it's simply a different model than pharmaceuticals. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, love psychedelics um, in all <laughs> their shapes, sizes, and doses. Um I just want to be mindful of the time here. I have two other topics that I really want to talk to you both about. So the first one is, yeah, we kind of briefly touched on it, but this idea of uh, the placebo effect and the expectancy effect, which gets super uh, highlighted in psychedelics because of the mind manifesting type right. of, um, you know, quality of them. But really, this is something that we can see anywhere in in, in the world, in any type of research. So what do you think, what do you think about that? What do you make of that, you know, study that came out? Was it two years ago and said, it's all, it's all a placebo no, it's, and it's not was, real. There were several really impressive studies where they managed somehow, and you have to read the studies very carefully, they managed not to find any results except that everyone who was in the study felt good about being in the study. And that in itself was an improvement. Now, there's years and years, decades of research on what's called attention, that when you attend to people, they will feel better. There's a whole occupation where all you, you do primarily is just listen to people. It's called psychotherapy. And there's some wonderful research where instead of psychotherapy, people talked into a microphone and it would record only when they spoke. And these were juvenile delinquents who were and like hardcore, you know, the courts are just waiting for them to get old enough to send them to jail. And they just talked into a tape recorder about whatever they wanted to talk about. And a lot of them stopped being delinquents just by not even being listened to, but being kind of recorded. And they knew that someone might listen to it. So a lot of what research is about, of course, is, of course, I expect to get some benefit for being in this research because the researchers wouldn't do it if there wasn't something positive. So every kind of research um, has expectancy. Everything you do, you know, I'm gonna go to a restaurant. Oh, I'm gonna hate the meal. Now, wait a moment, why are you going to the restaurant? No, no, I'm gonna enjoy the meal. Oh, okay, so I enter the restaurant with expectancy. Yes. 
So it's part of being, it, they've discovered, and I love this when science does it, they discovered what humans do all the time anyway. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and <laughs> I think, yeah, let's go back to the brain study. Uh, the brain study said people couldn't tell whether they were taking a psychedelic or not, which has to be really low because most of the placebo studies, the guessing is about 75% accurate, which means there's no double blind in the first place. Mm -hmm. But here was a study where nobody could tell and all the way, the only way you could tell the difference was to look at their capacity to do something well or better. And the people with psychedelics did it better. So um, there's always, you know, um, the only reason that most products that you buy work is half expectancy and half actual product. But it just gets ripped apart when it comes to microdosing and psychedelics. You know, it's let's like, like you said, always... it applies to everything, right? Yeah. It applies to yeah, everything. Once you get it applies it's to the everything. Nature of, it's yeah. the nature of how we function as humans. Well, there was an editorial actually today in the New England Journal of Medicine about a, uh, a study that just happened with psychedelics and depression. And the person writing the editorial um, basically was making that point that... Um, the question is: the question is, what are we doing that is different than expectation? Okay, and there's an expectation is terribly strong. And as someone years ago wrote and said, I don't care if it's a placebo or not. I haven't felt this good in twenty years. Yeah. And from a citizen science point of view, that's 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 success. It may not be from a, you know, mechanical science point of view, but then again, um, citizen science isn't about data it's about results mm. Mm -hmm. and let's also be clear that the placebo study that proved it's a placebo was a um it was done online it was self-dosed self-blinded uh there was no way to even know if people were taking lsd or a different substance or water so we need a real proper you know double blind placebo controlled type of test. It wasn't that. It was self-reported. Um, and again, it didn't matter if you were taking psilocybin or LSD. It was just you had to microdose something. So that's sure. another important thing to point oh, out. The other thing is um, what you want when you're trying to help people is to maximize the placebo and expectancy possibilities. Imagine going to your physician and he says, you know, you've had this problem and we haven't had anything for it. I've got something now that works and I'm going to give you some. And just before he hands it to you, he says, by the way, half of my patients, I'm not giving it to. I'm giving them a sugar pill. And you don't know which it is. You say, wait a moment. Wait a moment. That's not how life works. That's only how in a science lab it works. It won't work as well if I'm doubting whether I got a pill or not. So what we're trying to do is how do you maximize what, what placebo really means natural healing capacity? How do we maximize the natural healing capacity? And it looks like um, microdosing is one of the best ways. But we got to go find out for ourselves. Right? <laughs> now I'm afraid so. It's the only, <laughs> only final proof. Everyone put your citizen scientist hat on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. And um, last topic. Um, before we get into how people can connect and work with you guys and your new course coming up, um, Adam, you're a coach. You work with people all the time who are doing microdosing. So we covered the dose, the protocol, um, the technical basics. But you know, what is your words of wisdom for people to really elevate their microdosing experience? What What are some of the things that people can do? You know, um, Jim said take it seriously. <laughs> and he expressed what that means. You mentioned that it's a tool, right? So how can we like really use that tool to its highest potential? Yeah, I think education. I think you just have to educate yourself. I think, you know, the more books you can read on it, starting with the Psychedelic Explorers Guide, uh, everything you can watch on Dr. Fadiman on YouTube, there's, there's the Psychedelic Explorer right there. Uh, you just got to, you know, really dive deep and, and take it seriously, right? You know, if you were going to hike Mount Everest, you'd put some research into it. You wouldn't just go get a pair of shoes and a backpack and take off. You'd take some time studying and you'd train. And so 
don't just jump into it. Do, do your research. There's plenty of free stuff out there on YouTube and online for you to do so. And for people who are really interested, you know, check out these type of online classes that are being created by people like myself and Jim and other groups that really just want to get out there and educate people on how to be safe and reduce harm. And, you know, more than anything, I like to say that support set and setting are all important when it comes to microdosing for beginners. You know, you want to make sure that you have that support. And that's why I think coaching or even an online course, if you don't want to take a court, uh, coach is something that can really help to reduce harm mm -hmm. and help people have a more effective and optimized microdosing experience. Mm -hmm. I love that you didn't say meditation. <laughs> Right. Well, I, I like was most expecting things. you to say meditate, you know? Yeah. Well, if you just say meditate and you don't know what to do, but that's why there are classes, courses, online, YouTube, um, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah. the obvious truth is that, that if you take it, if you assume that it's, that it's important enough to perhaps change your health for the rest of your life, you say, well, is that worth like 15 minutes of Googling? And if it's not, then don't do it. Because, mm -hmm. you know, people say to me, well, I'm thinking of taking LSD. And I say, uh-huh. And they say, but, and I say, that's it. Stop. Don't do it. And they say, but you haven't heard all my reasons. I said, you just told me you have some reasons not to do it. So don't do it. And then they get mad at me and walk away. <laughs> and some of them get that they need to deal with their issues um, not with talk to somebody who supposedly knows more than they do about themselves. Okay. It's a very funny system. Yeah. And then I'm sure some of them come running back to you after they run away. At some well, point. <laughs> right now, um, Adam and I have a few things out there in the culture that you're welcome to ask us about. <laughs> yes. Well, perfect segue. So you guys have an, well, the course is actually going to be released by the time this is live. So people can go check it out, but tell us about this new course that's coming out. Yeah, it's the microdosing masterclass with psychedelics today. Uh, Jim has been kind enough. He's got uh, more than 60 minutes of just himself teaching on camera and talking about the history, how he came up with the protocol, all of the uh, amazing information. So Jim is one of our lead teachers and we have 14 other guest faculty members. Uh, Dr. Connor Murray, PhD, not only presented for 30 minutes on the first part of his LSD study, but I just recorded him last week talking about the latest study, which I told you about, which is the zero to 13 microgram placebo study I was talking about. So we've got guest teachers. And then myself, I'm teaching more than 10 hours of information on the history of microdosing from stoned ape to zoo pharmacognosy to the Raramari of Mexico up into best practices, applications, all of that stuff. That's with Psychedelics Today. Um, and that is online. That'll be in the show notes. I'm also super excited to be bringing psychedelics back to Esalen with Jim. Jim, would you want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, uh, we're doing something <clears throat> that Esalen is just uh, getting used to, which is to be worldwide at the same time that you're on campus. So Adam and I are doing a weekend on microdosing at Esalen in January. Um, sorry, it sold out on campus. It was uh, advertised at least a week ago. Um, and we're pretty excited that it sold out faster than anything else. Congrats. On the scene here. And the Saturday of that weekend will be streamed and people can attend just the Saturday and there will be uh, facilitation and chat all day uh, with, with what we're presenting. And we'll also have Colin, uh, Co uh, Connor Murray there. Um, so we're going to have a very exciting Saturday available worldwide. And will people be able to access that after the event digitally somehow? Um, because this will be I, after I, that. Yeah, I, th I think it's a. I think you get if you buy it for the day, you have it for another five days. I'm not sure what the rules are. This is Esalen learning okay. how to to be effective in streaming. What I will say is, what's pretty amazing with Esalen Institute is we are going to be able to put this out live to you on that Saturday, so people will be watching it live. If for some reason they have to work during those hours, they will have it available for viewing for, I believe, 72 hours up to seven days. So um, it is the digital hybrid. And for those of you that can't make it as we did sell out, um, can join us online and be a part of uh, Jim coming back to Esalen. And Jim, were, were you the first person to teach at Esalen? I was the first person that taught a seminar that anybody attended. 
and it wow. happened to be on psychedelics. And that was um, wow. somewhere in 1962. Oh my gosh, I can't even imagine who must have been in that room <laughs> at that time. <laughs> well, Esalen was pretty excited yeah. that people showed up because <laughs> it was an experiment. <laughs> Would you drive four hours to go to some seminar on something that you couldn't, you know, that, that was still legal, but nobody knew much about? But it must have grown eventually because Esalen was kind of where all the, I, I would call them the founding fathers of psychedelics in North America hung out. <laughs> Was it not? Yep. Yeah, it was. That you know, was Stan a Brock was in, in residence at Esalen, I don't know, for a year or so. Yeah, so. amazing. I would love to go there one day. Um, yeah, thanks so much for sharing. And who do you think would be able to benefit or who would you like to invite to consider taking this course? The evergreen one that's going to be available. Um, I would say of, really... Yeah, I'm sorry I, to interrupt you. Who, who's going to like ice cream? It's a hard, hard question. <laughs> it's psychedelics, if people. Hello, everyone's invited. Yeah, I mean, for the psychedelics community. If you're if you're serious about microdosing, this is a very good way to find out and to to handle whatever your questions are. That's why the, it's a, it will be live with the chat, but the chat will also be available. Um, if you've if you're just thinking about microdosing, obviously this is a good way to do it. So, so, you know, it's, it's one of those terrible things, which is it's good for people that know something, and it's probably a little better for people that don't know something. But those are the only two groups who should attend. Yeah, and I would say the microdosing masterclass with Psychedelics Today, which is the evergreen product of, you know, more than 10 hours of information on microdosing, I would say that's good for beginners, intermediates, and advanced. And what I'd say is when I was diving into microdosing four years ago, the hardest thing to find was the historical use of it. It was in very, very few places. So if the historical use of microdosing and the idea of jaguars eating ayahuasca and introducing it to man or llamas introducing the coca leaf to man or the true story of goats introducing coffee to us in 8900 by eating the red berries and then running around stimulated, those are the type of people to come, you know, take the class. And at the same time, if you want to skip the history, you can go right to the best practices. You can go right to dosages, protocols, substances, all that good stuff. So it's really open to anybody. So how do you, how do you get on to your course, Adam? Info commercial. Well, Lana will have all of the links in the show notes. Jim, right. thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Who's hosting this podcast? What's going on? <laughs> Yeah, we'll definitely have that linked in the show notes. This is going to be airing in a few months, but the course will be available then. And yeah, guys, check it out. It's going to be an amazing, amazing resource I did. Shout out to Psychedelics Today. They were like the OG psychedelics podcasters that I used to listen to way before I started this. So I'm sure it's going to be amazing. And I looked at the, I looked at the course curriculum and it looks amazing. And you guys have such great speakers there. So Yeah. It's going to be great. Any last uh, parting words of wisdom for the audience from either of you? Yeah. Any of you in the audience who would like to write a note to me about your own microdosing experience, particularly if you think it's unusual, incredibly grateful. My, my personal email is jfadiman at gmail, and we'll put it in the notes. And I'd be very, very, you will be help understand by telling me you are gifting other people beautiful any last words of wisdom adam for the audience i feel really grateful to be alive and to do this work alongside jim and yourself and psychedelics today and the esalen institute we have a birthright to these psychedelics and we're taking the power back so thanks for having us on today Amen to that. I love that. Thank you both so much for being here. And I, I can't wait for everyone in the audience to hear this conversation. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks.